Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Ardus Judania and I am here in my capacity as the co-founder of the Network of Spiritual Progressives, an organization that is working in cooperation with the Center for Interface Understanding in Singapore. And we have been since the start of this year um, hosting a series of interface conversations on the topic of constructive conditions for interface dialogue, drawing upon the theoretical work of uh, Professor Catherine Cornell, um, a Christian theologian who is based at um, Boston College in the United States. We have already had two very interesting and very informative sessions on, on, on this topic. And tonight is our third installment. We are going to examine the condition of commitment. Um, we have three excellent and exciting speakers who incidentally all are based in Singapore, who have an extensive and long uh, standing interest and engagement and record uh, in, in interface circles, both at an intellectual and um, lived experience level. One of the main questions we are going to explore tonight is, the question of how can we uh, remain committed to our own religious traditions and make sense of them and remain faithful to them and yet and yet be open to the truth in 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 the traditions of the religious sana. As I said, we have three excellent speakers who are going to provide their insights into this question from various perspectives. Um, the first speaker, and I'm just going to read out the bio, is um, uh, Associate Professor Paul Hedges, who is uh, one of the leading authorities in, in, in the space of interreligious studies and interfaith dialogue as well as comparative, comparative theology. And I've had the pleasure of working with Professor Hedges um, for quite a significant period of time. He worked on a couple of projects and I have keenly been following his outstanding academic work over the years. So I'm really excited that he is with us uh, today, this, this afternoon, this evening. So Professor, Associate Professor Paul Hedges <clears throat> is based at uh, uh, Raja Rantam School of International Studies at uh, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. He was also previously the reader in interreligious studies at the University of Winchester, United Kingdom, and has worked uh, for a number of British, Canadian, and Chinese universities. He, says he has also worked with a range of stakeholder groups outside of academia, including the Anglican Communion Network for Interfaith Concerns, the Tony Blair Faith Foundation, the Babaji Yogi Sangram, the Dialogue Society, the World Congress of Faith, and the BBC. He's on the editorial board of both the Journal of Religious History and Studies in Interreligious Dialogue. He has published extensively in interreligious studies, religious studies, and theology. His current research projects include interreligious relations in Singapore and the East and Southeast Asian region, as well as interreligious and intercultural hermeneutics. Paul, thank you so much for being with us today. You are indeed one of the pioneers and one of the leading voices in this space. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have um, many things to learn from you. You have the floor for about 25 minutes or so, and um, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for the extremely kind um, introduction there, Addis. Um, I don't know if I could call myself a pioneer in this field, but hopefully I've um, contributed something along the way. Now, I've been asked to talk to you about commitment um, from my own perspective 
and particularly in response to Catherine Connell's well-known conditions for dialogue, as Addis has already sort of mentioned. Um, and I'm doing this alongside both a Baha'i and, and a Muslim speaker. And so my aim, at least in part, is to bring a Christian perspective to this. But I'd also sort of like to speak, if you like, with my hat as a religious studies scholar and interreligious studies scholar on as, as well. And so sort of perhaps sort of widen out some of these questions. Now, first off, it might be useful if I identified myself. Um, and Addis has already sort of read out a short sort of biography, which places me with a certain academic narrative. So I'll describe myself, if you like, as, as a Christian. Um, I'm initiated into the Anglican tradition um, and brought up within a fairly middle of the road part of that broad sort of Anglican Church of England tradition. Um, but I have a definite fondness for what's often called the high church, the bells, the smells, the ritualist side. Um, but also I'm deeply appreciative of the simpler lower church traditions, especially that perhaps slightly outside my own denomination in groups such as the Quakers, where quietness and is, is dressed and ritual is sort of downplayed. Now, despite my initiation, by which I mean both baptism and confirmation as an Anglican, I sit in some ways perhaps uneasily alongside the tradition to which I claim allegiance. And I think a lot of my fellow Anglicans and, and other Christians would regard me as a heretic for a variety of reasons. Um, one of which is my rejection of the mythological accretions of deification that grew up around a first century Galilean rabbi Yeshua of Nazareth, as he became in relation to wider um, concerns, perhaps known as Jesus Christ and the theology that goes with this. I would also define myself as an Anglican pluralist, by which I mean that I see no reason to deny that access to whatever absolute reality may be, assuming there is such a thing, um, is just mediated by one tradition, and so may be equally found in Buddhist, Islamic, Baha'i, pagan or other traditions. And as my last comment may indicate, I take an agnostic stance towards that thing my tradition has normally termed God. And I have a foot at times, or at least partly, um, within the atheistic worldviews broadly conceived. So if we took Cornelia's conditions strictly as she defines them, I am pretty much the last person that she would want to do dialogue with. And this, of course, would be an intra-religious dialogue, um, in her case, between her Catholic affiliation and my Anglican one. And I think she would rule me out perhaps as a partner for interreligious dialogue more widely. In which case, perhaps I shouldn't be on this panel or part of this series, but I've been invited and I've been given this slot, so I'll plow on. Now, I've said that I'll split this talk into two parts, one speaking from my initiated sort of Christian stance, um, and another one sort of more scholarly asking questions about the whole issues of, of commitment. But as I think will become clear, maybe it already is sort of starting to be clear, um, that I, I, these two will inevitably go together. And in what I'm going to say, I'm not claiming any special or unique status for myself. I'm far from the only person who identifies in certain ways with the Christian tradition, but also sits sort of askance in relation to some of what may be determined by us as its core doctrinal aspects. But this is equally true of people in many other traditions as well. And indeed, few, if any, are strictly orthodox in a strict and full sense. And questioning for many is part of their journey of faith. And for some traditions, it is a central sort of tenet of perhaps what they do. So if I can just briefly digress and mention that one of the great pillars of the Western European traditions of Christianity, so Catholicism, Protestantism, um, Augustine of Hippo, was himself not really orthodox when it came to the doctrines of the Trinity, laid down in the centuries before him by the Council of Chalcedon. For Augustine was a Latin speaker, and this led him, in accordance with sort of certain trends, intellectual trends at the time, to see the Trinity in much more personalised ways than how, if you like, sort of the Greek language and the ethos of previous centuries had laid down what the uh, Trinity was meant to be. And certainly, 
when we talk about sort of Christianity and orthodoxy, far from there being a singular and agreed Christianity, and indeed things like the sort of Chalcedonian Creed, they didn't agree a single agreed Christianity, as if you like the conventional sort of narrative would tell us, it actually split Christianity into at least two parts, with those who by the conciliar definitions of the council would be considered heretics going on into subsequent centuries to be both more numerous and in many ways more globally influential than those who come to Catholic and Protestant and also Orthodox strands. But fate has, however, brought it to pass that a historically minority and in some ways quite aberrant Christianities of the Western end of Eurasian landmass have become today and over the last couple of centuries globally dominant and able to define orthodoxy in their terms on a grand and normative scale. Our notions, therefore, of what a commitment is are shaped by historical accident and the convoluted sort of narratives tell us perhaps sort of what is normative and how we should sort of see this in relation to anything else. And therefore accusations of orthodoxy or heresy are in part defined by power dynamics as much as anything else. As such, in defining myself in relation to a specific tradition and my commitment to it, I am questioning what commitment to that tradition entails. It is not one tradition, it is not even an agreed tradition, and what is mainstream now has not always been mainstream, nor even able to claim in any credible scholarly way that it sort of represents, if you like, the earliest foundations or, or the origins or even sort of what was supposedly agreed um, <coughs> by these councils that it looks back to <coughs> as foundational. Now, having said this, I've also defined myself within a particular branch of these traditions, the Anglican tradition, and I don't think I need to rehash here the very particular and peculiar history um, of my own sort of denomination. But it is, as I've noted, a broad church in terms of what's called its churchmanship of how sort of ritual and tradition um, is played out, but also theologically is a broad church too. And in the 19th century, the great German linguist and scholar of religion, Friedrich Max Muller, when asked why he was an Anglican, replied with more or less these words, it is the only church I can belong to that lets me believe whatever I want. And certainly since the late 19th century, it became apparent, at least in the Church of England, that it was impossible to convict an Anglican priest or lay person for heresy. There became then, if you like, a freedom of theological thought in its development, and there are today a good number of pluralist priests in the Church of England, and also some atheist priests, often under the sea of faith movement. As such, while I've drawn myself as being perhaps of outside the tradition to which I claim allegiance in some ways, I have not done so in a way that would prevent me from being a priest within that tradition. Now, I'm not a priest, I've no intention of becoming one, but that's another matter. Now, Cornelia suggested that in her condition of commitment, it is required that a person believe and stick to what it agreed doctrinal cause of her tradition. The point being for her that you are a representative of your own tradition to others. And Cornelia assumes that to be an authentic dialogue it requires the committed meeting of doctrinal commitments in the face of two or more committed believers. Yet the doctrinal core that Cornell would want us to hold are to some degree at least fluid and malleable. And certainly as an Anglican, I've noted that Mark many would sort of define him as a heretic. I can find a good number of Anglican theologians, both lay and priestly, who I could cite to back up my particular points of view. Now, while I've raised this in relation to my Anglican identity, I could also ask wider commitment, so questions about commitment. And here, within the Southeast Asian world, much religiosity, and leaf into the side for the moment, debates around what religion, religions, religiosity, religiousness may mean, religiosity has often been done in the form of practice and behaviour. The notion that belief or creedal affirmations or faith of some type comes first is alien. Prayers are offered as part of a tradition done by one's family, clan, ancestors or community. And it's the efficacy of prayers offered 
or to a particular skill or also expertise of priests or to perceived areas of influence of supernatural figures that are often far more vital than a specific set of belief commitments. So you might pray to a certain deity for luck before journeys, um, and that's a deity for childbirth or reproduction, and yet others may be linked to wealth, harvests, particular locations or certain festivals. And it is this application and pragmatic justification rather than a belief system that has been core, if you like, to the commitments of people within these systems. And I've argued um, before in, in, in some papers that within the Sinitic and the broader East Asian religious landscape, that what we see may be termed strategic religious participation. I repeat that, strategic religious participation. It indicates a form of religiosity within a field where the primary driver is not commitment to a creedal statement or commitment within one doctrine based stance, but an engagement across a shared religious landscape where it is assumed that many pathways or practitioners or deities may be accessed for particular purposes. And I think this is true beyond the Far Eastern context. And the idea of sincere commitment to one stated identity has not been the norm for how religion has been practiced across the centuries and around the world. Cornell's concept of commitment therefore distances much of the world's religious practice from the field of dialogue because people have not related to the field that we term religion in the ways that Cornell, in her conditions for dialogue, sets this out. Now, I don't want to get distracted into sort of convoluted and ongoing disputes within the field of the study of religion around what religion might mean and how it's defined. Um, but it's worth noting that how we sort of define it today, there's a modern Western and Christian, especially Protestant, but also somewhat Catholic set of assumptions that lead into this, what is often termed the world religions paradigm as to what gets counted as religion and therefore what gets included within the matrix of dialogue. And I think that a certain sort of decolonial lens will warn us against taking a particular Western and Christian perspective as normative. Now, with these points noted, I'll circle back around to come again and talk perhaps from uh, more of an insider sort of Christian perspective, but also an analytic and scholarly lens, which I hope will help us think about commitment and its various aspects. So I'll note six ways that commitment might be measured for the Christian, at least. First, as I've mentioned, there's the question of belief, a commitment to creedal statements and to formal norms of your doctrinal tradition. I said this is what I've mainly spoken about so far, but there are five more. So secondly, ritual practice could be another marker. For some Christians, or for most Christians, this typically means weekly attendance at the Eucharist or communion or mass, as it's sometimes known. Um, and in the Church of England, the minimum expectation is that you'll attend twice a year at Easter and Christmas. And so someone who attends this ritual at the Eucharist could be seen as meeting the requirements of being a Christian. Now, obviously, over the last year with COVID, this has been more difficult, if not impossible, if you like to actually attend. Um, to these ritual events. But also for other Christians, the Eucharist may not be considered so important. For some, it's simply that one way in which the tradition has formalized and ritualized the memory of what is seen as Jesus's Last Supper with his disciples. I mean, in the earliest Christian movement, they held more or less formal or informal um, uh, meals when, when they met, what was often called the agape feast or the love feast, where Christians would mark their sort of solidarity by eating together across barriers of, of class or otherwise so they would eat and drink freely with each other. And so some people may suggest that this ritual is not necessary to be a Christian. The next point extends from this into what I might term a form of belonging or community commitment because while you could skip from church to church and do a different community each one, it's normally been expected, although it's not a, perhaps a strict requirement, that one becomes a member of a particular church or parish. 
And within the UK, there are certainly some Anglicans who might prefer to rather more anonymous ritual participation at cathedrals rather than going to their local parish church. Various dynamics might play into this. They may prefer the style of worship at the cathedral, or people who are more introverted and extroverted um, may find, if you like, the enforced bonhomie um, with people who might share very little apart from the Christian identity at the end of services um, to be a very taxing sort of ordeal to have to go through every week and if they get drained by these interactions that might be another reason for this. But as I've mentioned there are expectations uh, that Christian participation is normally within a particular sort of church community itself and so that could also be another marker. For while Christianity has often been portrayed as in some ways a distinctly individualistic tradition where one seeks one's own personal salvation and it's even been argued it's a source or even the source of modern notions of individualism, it also has very strong communal aspects and the saying attributed to Jesus that I am the vine and you are the branches is often seen as part of this and that one becomes again using biblical language one body and Paul's letters were often concerned with ensuring the group cohesion of Christians and to some extent they stressed the impossibility of living a Christian life outside of the new ethnos that he envisages um, out of sort of the Jewish tradition of his time in this new uh, movement. Then fourthly, there are social norms. What does it mean to behave, belong and look like a Christian? The Church of England, fairly or unfairly, has often been described as a conservative party at prayer. And in many contemporary debates, such as immigration or Brexit, rank and file members of the Church of England have been shown to be far more small c conservative than the country as a whole. Also, the priests and certainly the bishops have tended to lean in the opposite direction, um, often arguing for biblical injunctions about sort of kindness to immigrants, for instance. And with this sort of note about this sort of sense of sort of social norms, in some churches at least, your being sort of accepted into a community is perhaps as much about sort of how, how, how you look, how you behave, the way you speak, um, as anything else is about sort of being the right type of person. And while it's not an Anglican issue per se, so I won't perhaps mention it, the recent marriage of a British Prime Minister in a Catholic cathedral, despite there being very little evidence that he is any sort of Christian, um, two previous sort of Anglican weddings notwithstanding might be an indication of this. Now that last marker brings me to the next, the fifth point, which is adherence to certain ethical standards. And I purposely keep this distinct from the social norms. Now, while it is sort of complicated, we may expect the United Christian is somebody who behaves in Christian moral terms. Now, of course, what this means will differ from tradition to tradition and over time and location. But one of the most prominent saints of the medieval Christian tradition, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, advocated that Christians should slaughter Muslims without mercy. Indeed, it was better to try and kill them than even seeking to convert them in his rhetoric. However, I think it fair to say that almost without exception, identifying as a Christian in today's Singapore or UK Australia um, would mean endorsing that we should live in harmony with those gracious neighbours, friends and colleagues as the Islamic persuasion. But it also raises other questions if ethics is part of this commitment, does this trump anything else? Or as people may ask the question, does God care more about what you believe or what you do? Again, does it trump the ritual commitments? So again, is God's concern that you sit in your pew and sing hymns and listen to the sermon on a Sunday morning, or do you go out and feed the poor, clothe the needy and visit prisoners to mention some things that Jesus suggested was sort of requirements. Now on this perhaps changing dynamics, the Filipino sociologist J. J. L. Serrano Cornelio has found that despite official Catholic injunctions that weekly mass attendance is a requirement for Catholic identity, young uh, Filipino Catholics um, are increasingly seeing their Catholic identity in terms of charitable work. So their commitment is to their charity work, their service, rather than ritual performance. Now, 
The last point around commitment, sixthly, is the most subjective factor, which is personal identification. Now, while in social terms, you perhaps acquire a tradition or community to accept somebody to be part of that group, a person may feel a sense of belonging or identity apart from that acceptance. And this may occur for a variety of reasons, such as social ostracism, accusations of heresy, or simply differing definitions of what commitment or belonging means. And certainly if you have a strong sense of what your personal commitment is, which is different from that of the wider tradition, then you will see a, a mismatch here. But this as it's very much an existential rather than a social form, and it can also cut both ways. Somebody may be ritually observant, say the correct words of belief be socially included, but may feel no personal sense of commitment to or belief in to tradition that for whatever reasons, they find it useful or necessary to do the outward observances for. Now, I don't present these six points as a definitive account of how commitment can be measured in Anglicanism or beyond, but I hope to show that Cornell's sense of deep affinity to certain creed and norms is far from the only way to define commitment. And that as an Anglican, it may not be the only mark of commitment to which somebody like myself or anybody else um, may look to, which is not to say that I necessarily fit all of these criteria I've just been um, talking about. You are certainly far more likely to find me seated in meditation derived from Buddhist traditions than sitting in a Eucharist. And I don't recall ever having been to visit a prisoner. But commitment to a tradition may mean many things. And just to conclude, I might suggest as well that dialogue should be more than the meeting together of those people who most fit the stereotypes of their traditions. The dialogue should also include those who sit less squarely in relation to what ways that current power dynamics define as the mainstream markers of tradition. Dialogue, it has been argued, can reinforce the position of certain elites or elite representations of religion. But more than this, as I said, even if we stress sort of commitment as part of what is needed for dialogue, commitment is a complicated marker and how we define identity within, within a religious tradition, a tradition which will always be multiple and complex, needs reflection and how this then leads into dialogue is itself an open to question. Okay, thank you. Uh, many, many thanks for, for this uh very thought-provoking uh, presentation and your critical engagement with Cornell's uh, uh, conditions, as, especially as they relate to uh, the idea of commitment. Uh, you have uh, touched upon a number of very important concepts from the idea of orthodoxy, how malleability is, what constitutes orthodoxy, who decides what what constitutes orthodoxy, the idea of multiplicity of, of, of the, the, the concept of tradition within one single faith tradition. You have raised the question of representation. And uh, of course, um, uh, in your second part of the lecture, uh, you have provided a very helpful typology, if you like, of, of, of of the kind of the constituting elements of, of that one could adopt in terms of thinking about to what extent, if it is possible at all, if uh, to measure measure commitment. I have definitely, I have certainly learned a lot from from you, and um, do have a few questions that I would like to ask you later on. Uh, uh, and um, I'm sure uh, our listeners also will have a few questions uh, and, they, they, and I hope they have learned as much as I have. Um, so thank you very much again for taking your time uh, and um, to be with us and I look forward to uh, our Q&A session. Okay, thank you, Addis. Thank you, thank you very much. Fantastic, so our next, uh, our next presenter is uh, uh, Mohammed Imran Taib. Um, so uh, again, is, is, uh, Mohammed is uh, or Imran uh, uh, is someone that I have had the pleasure of being acquainted with for a number of years now. Um, uh, we have met in person 
on on few occasions. Um, I have also keenly tried to follow many important initiatives that Imran has been part of. Um, he is definitely one of the leading voices, especially in Southeast Asia, when it comes to issues pertaining to not only interfaith dialogue, but also questions pertaining to uh, Islamic reform um, and many, many issues pertaining to Muslim religiosity in the modern world. So let me just read out his short bio that doesn't really do justice to all the things that have been that he has been part of and his critical contribution that he's making across a variety of fields and platforms. So Mohammed Imran Mohammed Taib is the founder and board member of the Center for Interfaith Understanding in Singapore that is co-hosting this event. And he's also the director of Budi, an intercultural consultancy. He has been an interfaith uh, advocate for many, many years, writing, researching, and speaking on issues of diversity, multiculturalism, and Muslim reform. Imran's commentaries have been published in various local and international newspapers, journals, and magazines. He was also formally associated with the Islamic Religious Council of Singapore, and he was a former associate research fellow at the Rajarantam School of International Studies. So Imran, as you can see from the bio, has been wearing many hats and has been doing some fantastic work. Uh, uh, and I really admire him. And I'm also very, very honored to have him speak. So Imran, thank you very much for being here. And the floor is yours. Thank you, um, Adis, um, for your very kind words. Uh, and uh, hello, everyone who's watching. Uh, I hope you can see the slides, yeah? Yeah. Um, after Paul's presentation, I really feel um, <laughs> uh, that he had deconstructed a lot of uh, Cornell's uh, ideas, especially surrounding the, the idea of commitment that I felt. Um, I'm not sure whether my presentation will stand, but uh, I take it as uh, this is work in progress and I, I'm thinking as I move along uh, in engaging with this whole idea of commitment within the framework of interfaith dialogue. Um, and I come from the perspective uh, as an advocate of interfaith dialogue who's been very much involved for many years uh, in this field. Uh, also, I self-identify as a Muslim. Um, and uh, But my presentation today will uh, largely be based on uh, my own thoughts uh, and my own engagement uh, in the field of interfaith dialogue as a practitioner. So um, I will be discussing uh, the uh, framework of Cornell's idea on commitment within uh, my own personal experience being involved in interfaith dialogue. Now, uh, why the um, initial uh, thought about digging deep into the tradition. Uh, it's because I drew very much from the metaphor of uh, drawing water from the well. Uh, now, I'm not particularly sure where this metaphor uh, emerged, uh, but it's uh, been uh, quite uh, well founded in, in some traditions, uh, in Arabic traditions, even in, in Chinese traditions, uh, is the idea that if you are looking for water, then you dig deep rather than to dig many uh, shallow uh, uh, wells. Uh, but that also speaks about how deep down the ground, uh, the source of life itself, which is water, uh, can be drawn from many sources. Uh, and that's where the, the idea of the common well spring in which it nourishes uh, life as it is. So there can be many wells, uh, but each drawing from their own uh, land, uh, but it also uh, uh, came from, from, from a common uh, a wellspring. Uh, and people may use differently the water that is drawn from these different wells. So that is the kind of metaphor that I imagine when it comes to uh, the various faith traditions that we have and how we engage with each other. Um, so the presentation that I'll be sharing today will be exploring a, a lot more on the intersection between 
commitment to the religious faith, uh, which is about digging uh, our own well deeply uh, and the transformation of the self and understanding uh, in the sense that we come to know that there are also other wells and other communities who are digging their own wells very deeply. Uh, and also it intersects with the idea of interreligious cooperation where uh, each community is committed to, uh, to this common source of humanity and also to this, uh, the, the source of where we draw our experiences and also we relate to the whole meaning of life and existence itself. And uh, let's look at uh, Cornell's framework. Uh, for Cornell, dialogue is a necessity in interreligious encounters. Uh, but of course, she would say that uh, most religions are not by nature disposed to constructive dialogue. Uh, that does not mean that uh, the principle of dialogue is not well enunciated in, in, in many religions, but it's just that the community of believers might not be by nature uh, disposed to constructive dialogue, um, although they can be. Uh, and therefore it requires some degree of uh, hermeneutical effort, uh, trying to make sense and trying to understand how each religion relates to other religions uh, and the commitment to actually mine the religious traditions uh, uh, is pretty much required uh, in order to move uh, interfaith dialogue forward. So uh, this is what uh, Cornell uh, had asserted, and I uh, kind of agree with uh, much of her uh, assertions here. Uh, and she then develops the conditions that are uh, necessary for interreligious dialogue to occur. And uh, this is where this series is trying to engage with these five conditions for interreligious dialogue that Cornell had uh, proposed. Uh, we had the session on humility the last time, and today we are looking at commitment. Now, before I move uh, to try to unpack a, a bit more about this whole idea of commitment within the framework of interreligious dialogue, uh, I want to address two common perceptions uh, that I notice, uh, uh, at least in Singapore setting when it relates to interfaith dialogue. Uh, firstly, is the idea that interfaith dialogue uh, is done by people with little commitment to their faith, uh, don't know much about their own faith, or wishy-washy about their own beliefs. Now, yes, probably there are such individuals, but the vast majority of people doing interfaith dialogue, at least uh, in my experience uh, and in my encounters, uh, are those who actually begin from a particular faith standpoint and they remain committed to their faith throughout the journey. Uh, and this is something that is observable and uh, it speaks to Cornell's own uh, assumptions about what it means to be doing interfaith dialogue. Um, and why do I say that a lot of individuals, at least in my experience, uh, those who are involved in interfaith dialogue begins from a faith standpoint and remain committed to their faith is because a lot of these interfaith dialogue proponents realize that they do not know what they thought that they knew. And this is something that I personally also experienced in my early years uh, being involved in interfaith dialogue where it shatters my own assumptions and my own worldview that, uh, that uh, starts from this idea that I uh, claim to be self-sufficient and I know everything that needs to be known about uh, religion and about God and things around me. But the moment I encounter my own ignorance, then it, it's a point of no return. And that keeps me going. And I suppose that also speaks for individuals who are proponents of interfaith dialogue who come from a standpoint that they do not know what they thought that they knew and therefore that kept, keeps them going. So that level of commitment uh, is uh, present at least uh, from my observation thus far. And this is, this is the sense of growth that sustains people on the path of interfaith dialogue. But at the same time also, um, I recognize that it requires a lot of courage because uh, to say that you do not know uh, is something that uh, requires a lot of courage uh, and to acknowledge that what we know is probably not enough or even uh, incomplete or even false is something that requires courage and it requires strength for us to continue uh, searching for uh, and, and being on that path uh, towards greater truth. 
And it requires a lot of steadfastness also in the pursuit of the greater truth. And that is the moment of realization when you are involved in interfaith dialogue and you're committed to, to, to the path that you realize that truth is greater than any individual or any tradition or any uh, faith system. Uh, and these are qualities that, in my personal opinion, builds for resilient faith. And that is why uh, I would disagree that interfaith dialogue uh, is done by people with very little commitment to their faith, don't, don't know much about their own faith or wishy-washy about their own beliefs. Uh, at least in my experience, people who are advocates of interfaith dialogue are deeply committed and they show the courage, strength and steadfastness at least uh, in looking at the issues uh, together with people of various faiths. Now, the second perceptions to interfaith dialogue that I want to address here is this idea that interfaith dialogue will eventually dilute your faith. Now, uh, in my personal observation and experience also, I would say that this, is, this hardly happens. Uh, and it also really depends on what is meant by faith. Uh, if by faith it is a handed down set of unquestioned beliefs and assumptions, then perhaps yes, interfaith dialogue may possibly rock uh, these very foundations that you hold without question or the assumptions that you have held uh, without questioning. But at the same time, we have to recognize that this moment also offers an opportunity to start examining and questioning what we think that we know, which strikes at the very heart of the question of then we asking ourselves, how do we know uh, what we come to know? So it's a kind of an epistemic uh, uh, shift that is required uh, the moment you are involved in interfaith dialogue. And rather than diluting your faith, it can be seen as uh, a point of enriching the faith in the light of what you had not known but now knows. And that is why uh, interfaith dialogue, again, I must emphasize, requires a lot of courage because it requires you questioning you, what you thought that you know, uh, and also for you to be transformed by the very encounters that you have with people of other faiths. Now, having said that, um, I'm going to explore a bit more on commitment as part of interfaith dialogue as proposed by uh, uh, Cornell. Um, and this is where Cornell distinguishes between interfaith dialogue and just simply a personal exploration for spiritual enrichment. So she made a distinction here, and uh, I, I, I thought that this distinction is important for us to move forward to, to unpack the idea of commitment. Um, for, Con for Cornell, the, the, the latter, which is the personal exploration for spiritual enrichment, is guided more by personal taste and judgment. So you will have people who are just exploring and, and, and uh, reading and discussing and trying to find their own path uh, within this whole variety of religious traditions, faiths and beliefs. But uh, that is different from interfaith dialogue, which involves uh, uh, representing a particular tradition uh, and also it involves being accountable to that tradition and submitting one's judgment to that of a larger whole. That means you cannot run away from the fact that you are circumscribed by the tradition in which you have uh, grown into, uh, of which you belong to, uh, or you self-identify, and also a tradition that uh, has its own baggage history, as well as its own uh, intricacies. Uh, and we can't run away from that uh, in our own personal uh, uh, biography, right? Um, and that is where I think Paul's presentation just now has nicely unpacked what it means to be belonging to a particular tradition. What does it mean to be accountable to that tradition? And what does it mean to be submitting uh, one's judgment to a larger whole and who holds this larger whole uh, and whether this larger whole itself is something that is questionable and can be unpacked further. Now, uh, the other aspect of commitment as part of interfaith dialogue uh, is that one speaks from uh, and for a particular tradition as perspective within a faith. And here, of course, uh, Connie will acknowledge that uh, your particular faith and tradition is not something that is to be accepted as monolithic uh, and, and uh, one whole part. Actually, this is where, as Paul has mentioned, there's a lot of intra-faith uh, engagements that goes within as part of the interfaith uh, dialogue process. So if I were to speak, for example, uh, uh, in an interfaith dialogue setting uh, and coming from a tradition that I identify as Islam and, and myself as a Muslim, 
then I have to be very clear also that it's a, from a particular tradition or perspective within this Islamic faith that has to come forth uh, and has to come to the front whenever I speak, because I am informed by the idea that uh, Islam itself is not a monolithic religion uh, and possibly my own experience uh, and my own uh, learning uh, will shape uh, how I came to speak from as well as for this tradition. So uh, uh, one should be involved in interfaith dialogue uh, as transparent as possible. For example, uh, I have to acknowledge that I come from a Sunni tradition within the Islamic faith. And some of my perspective might come from uh, a, a minority uh, perspective within the tradition, or it could also be as part of mainstream, but then who decides and what uh, authority determines uh, uh, whether these subgroups are something that is to be uh, accepted within the uh, faith tradition, right? Uh, and this, this is where uh, it makes for very interesting and very rich conversations uh, in interfaith dialogues uh, when one comes forward and be as transparent instead of speaking as a Muslim, a Christian, a Hindu, a Buddhist, etc., but to be much more specific from which subgroup or which particular tradition within that tradition itself. And we have to acknowledge also that commitment as part of interfaith dialogue is not just uh, an expression of personal opinion, but also that opinion has a whole tradition of reflection on important uh, 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 religious questions that one has to be acquainted with. Uh, so it's not just uh, me coming to the table and just speaking of my mind, but also I have to be aware that I carry this whole tradition in which I have to be aware of uh, in terms of how that tradition is reflected on some of these important questions on religion. Uh, and therefore it requires some seriousness in terms of study, in terms of research, in terms of digging deeper into my own faith uh, before I could uh, even say that I'm now fully acquainted to be involved in interfaith dialogue. Uh, it requires a lot of uh, effort and seriousness. Uh, and this is something that perhaps is also kind of scary, uh, but at the same time also it, it's a lot more promising because by being involved in interfaith dialogue, you actually return to your own tradition and you get enriched by that encounter in which makes you see your own tradition in a new light. So this willingness to engage and re-engage with one's own tradition, uh, with insights and uh, experience gained uh, from, uh, uh, from or through the dialogue itself, uh, that is uh, the promising part of this whole component of being committed uh, as part of uh, the interfaith dialogue process. And one must necessarily in the end be transformed in this whole process. And that is why uh, interfaith dialogue that does not produce any personal transformation in terms of ideas or even uh, in terms of conduct uh, is something that perhaps needs to be uh, questioned a little bit more. Now, I'll move on to, to, to unpack further uh, what uh, commitment uh, means. Yeah. So uh, what I do notice is that uh, one can understand, <clears throat> sorry, understand commitment in two forms. One is it could be commitment that is externally driven. And secondly, is uh, commitment that is internally driven. I've seen a lot of externally driven commitment. Uh, uh, by this, I mean that one just have to be committed to some basic sense of human solidarity. You know, we have to be committed to cooperate and to work for the common good, which uh, brings uh, mutual benefits. Uh, this kind of externally driven commitment uh, uh, can be seen a lot in many interfaith settings where faith groups and faith driven individuals come together uh, because of some utilitarian or transactional uh, reasons, you know, uh, utilitarian in the sense that, okay, we all want to live together in peace and we will not want to be in a situation where we are uh, killing each other or we are not uh, um, uh, we are causing a lot of chaos, so we wouldn't want that. So let's all come together, work together, because it will bring mutual benefits. So it's a very transactional kind of commitment that uh, is being externally driven. But um, what I want to prod and also to, 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 to explore a little bit more is this internally driven commitment that requires engagement with difference through dialogue uh, and the openness to learning 
uh, that is necessary um, uh, in this whole process. And therefore, it's, it's, it's axiomatic as well as it's transformational in terms of its uh, uh, end results. Now, um, I will explore a little bit more on internally driven commitment. Uh, it requires uh, preparing oneself for a dialogue. So it's not just a matter of entering into a dialogue and just uh, engaging in, in discussions. Yeah? Uh, there are some uh, preparations that one has to, to, to be acquainted with. And firstly, uh, a dialogue requires the willingness to listen and to learn from people, stories, ideas, perspectives, and many more. Um, and therefore, it's not just a luxury uh, where if we have time, then we engage in interfaith dialogue, but no. Uh, to me, and also Catherine Cornell emphasized that it's a matter of religious necessity. So what does it mean in the words of Paul Nieter, for example, to be religious interreligiously? And what is it within our faith tradition that actually requires us to be engaged in this whole process and commitment towards uh, engagement with other faiths? Uh, and therefore, in this whole process, uh, it actually speaks to the possibility of change and growth from the idea that I'm self-sufficient, that I, I know all that I need to know, to one that is openness and willingness to be transformed and to enrich oneself uh, through this experience and this uh, contact with people of other faiths. Uh, and here I, I want to draw on Abu Patil's uh, five types of experiences that is promising towards uh, this whole uh, idea of change and growth. Uh, there could be moments of inspiration or enrichment at the moment we encounter uh, people of other faiths through, through dialogue. And here I don't necessarily uh, mean dialogue as in just an exchange of words. Uh, dialogue could be in many forms, including the dialogue of life, where one actually worked together uh, um, uh, for, for, for humanity or for the common good. So there could be moments where we are inspired and we are enriched by the encounters that we have with people of other faiths. Then there are also moments where we actually feel connected and we form relationship. We become good friends or we, you know, we, 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 we feel that uh, we, we share uh, uh, aspirations, the same aspirations as, as well as uh, the same uh, ideals and things like that. And the third one is moments where we sometimes we recognize uh, that we have been prejudicial uh, and also that at times uh, our experience might be something that is conflictual in nature. Either that kind of sense of conflict that we have within ourselves or a kind of conflict uh, with people that we disagree with, but at the same time, we come to realize how we can move that conflict into something that is much more productive and uh, transformational. And therefore it contributes to the change and growth that we need from that encounter. And there's also moments of action or cooperation when we see certain things and we want to address the suffering of humanity, we want to address the injustices, et cetera. And the fifth one is the moments of recognizing difference even. Yet in that difference, we also come out of it with some form of admiration. For example, if I were to observe the rituals done by person from another faith, now I recognize that those are not the rituals that I partake in, but at the same time, I can admire that there is something deep and meaningful in that whole process of reaching out to the divine mystery uh, in their own uh, sense or ways. So recognizing that difference and yet coming out with admiration is another type of experience that can lead to that change and growth that uh, we talk about here. Now, um, I will talk about the stages of commitment and here I um, use, or I, I, I derive a lot from my own personal experience where the moment we, we feel that we are committed to our own faith and that commitment shows through our need to study our own religion, yeah? And study here is in the broader sense, not just a, a conventional idea of learning, but uh, it also includes uh, reflecting, researching, uh, uh, investigating, questioning your own uh, faith and religion as part of the process of trying to be acquainted very deeply with your own faith tradition. So we one start by studying uh, one's own religion uh, and here at this stage, perhaps we might come with this idea that we are self-sufficient or our religion is self-sufficient and there's internal, definitely internal coherence that keep us committed to this faith, right? Uh, but then humans are also um, 
living as social animals and therefore we encounter difference. We encounter people who actually are also committed to their own faith. And there will be moments of curiosity where we actually ask ourselves, what about people of other faiths and why do they do what they do and why do they believe what they believe in? Uh, and this moment of curiosity allows us uh, uh, to encounter difference and to ask what this difference means. Uh, and that is what I would call uh, the epistemic shift that was required uh, for us to then transit to the next stage because this um, encounter with difference and asking what does it mean um, creates some tensions and also contradictions between our own beliefs uh, and uh, our own practices with that of others. Um, but we can either suppress it and retreat back into the, uh, into the um, our own comfort zone of our own faith tradition, or we might emerge uh, thinking that perhaps truth is larger than us, you know, uh, that God is larger than uh, any single sum of an individual uh, or tradition, and therefore truth is bigger, and we need to pursue that truth with a capital T. Yeah, capital T. And that uh, brings us to the second stage of the commitment where we begin to study other religions, but what we have in our toolbox is just what we know about our own faith. And therefore the second stage uh, that emerged out of this process is studying other religions in the light of your own religion. Now, um, this uh, brings to uh, our first foray into this whole question of what is our own theology of religions uh, amidst this diversity. Uh, and again, we can look at it from uh, the standpoint of an exclusivist, for example, and retreat back into the comfort of our own religion by abrogating all the other religions and saying that it has been sub supplanted by our own faith that is absolute, complete, and all there is to know about the reality out there. Uh, or we could adopt a more inclusivist or even a pluralist approach uh, which means that uh, there is something worth uh, considering from other faiths uh, and there are truths that we can actually learn from, that we can be enriched from, from, from other traditions. Uh, and that brings us to the third stage where we begin uh, to look seriously at other faiths uh, and be committed to studying other religions, not just from the light of our own religion, but also on their own terms. And this is the moment of realization also because we will then want people to actually look at our religion from a foreign uh, perspective, but rather from within its own internal uh, resources. Uh, and that's how we should be studying other religions on their own terms. And that is the third stage of the commitment to towards interfaith dialogue. And it brings more questions uh, because we realize that there are internal coherence also in other faiths. Uh, and there are diff just simply different worldviews that uh, uh, it's neither right or wrong, but uh, it's a point of uh, uh, perspectives and, and therefore it brings us into this whole uneasiness about uh, our own commitment to our own faith, as well as the need to acknowledge that there are truths in other faiths. And it brings to, to the fourth stage where we begin to re-engage then with our own religion in the light of these encounters with other religions, uh, where we begin to seriously adopt a more a, a different perhaps hermeneutical way of looking at our own faiths and re-engaging our own faiths in the midst of diversity in the midst of what we have encountered in uh, of other faiths in which we admire as well as we uh, um, uh, come to believe in 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 the mutual truths that is being shared across the traditions so uh, i will end by by coming back to this whole question of what does commitment therefore looks like and um I will look at four areas to be looked at, uh, and this is within the context of Islam. Of course, I will not ex explicate uh, uh, this in detail, but rather to ask questions, and, and this is something that we can explore mutually uh, in other time. Uh, one is to look at uh, Islam's fundamental acceptance of diversity and ask what does the sacred text, in this case, the Quran, uh, speaks about this fundamental issue of diversity, whether it's part of God's will, uh, and it's something that is to be obliterated or it's something to be embraced. And of course, clearly there are answers and there has been Muslim scholars, plenty of them who have actually explained on Islam's fundamental acceptance of diversity has seen in the various uh, verses in the Quran. Um, 
And we can also look at the early Muslim encounters with people of other faiths. How did they react to other community of faiths while remaining committed to their own faith, uh, which is Islam? And of course, there are different uh, ways of, uh, uh, sorry, the, there are different uh, um, experiences uh, of these encounters uh, ranging from the crusade uh, for, uh, to, to a, a more positive uh, engagement uh, in, in several parts of the Muslim world. Uh, but even if we look as early as uh, during the prophetic period of how the prophet treated the Christians from Najran uh, who came uh, over and had dialogues with them. Uh, so these are areas in which we need to uh, rediscover and dig into our tradition, which then develops into what we call the theolo theologies of religions, which is a pretty new field in the modern period within Mus uh, Muslim scholarship. Of course, there are, has been uh, Muslim scholars in the past who have developed ideas about uh, other faiths uh, in light of uh, uh, Islam, but this whole field of theologies of religions within the Islamic discipline is something that is not much uh, explored uh, until much more recent time. So we can look at the various ideas that has been developed within the Islamic tradition in response to these encounters with other faiths. And lastly, look at the present action and how Muslims act out their respective theologies of religions. And I would say here that uh, in the modern era, uh, at least there has been many um, uh, initiatives done by Muslim groups all over the world uh, in the field of interfaith dialogue. And the issue is for us to actually uncover what is the theology of religion that they hold on that uh, makes them want to engage in interfaith dialogue uh, and be committed to this whole process as how I explained earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Imran. Uh, this was truly a fascinating presentation, really. Um, I, I, I don't know where to start. It's very difficult to summarize, but I, I, the idea of digging from the well was really attractive to me and I'm sure to many of our listeners as a metaphor. You, then you talked about the, the common erroneous perceptions of uh, when it comes to those who are taking part in interfaith dialogue, the idea that those who are active in this space uh, either are not really committed to their religious tradition or that once you do become a participant in this space, you are, you know, there is the danger of them diluting your own faith tradition. You have given us wonderful reasons and counterexamples of why that is not necessarily the case. And then indeed the opposite might be the case. Your faith could be enriched and that uh, based on your personal experience, extensive personal experiences, that those people who do engage in interfaith dialogue are very much truly committed to their religious faith. Then you have also provided us with a very interesting and to me very fruitful a way of looking at the concept of, of commitment itself. And you looked at the motivations, the ex extrinsic, if I could use that word. Uh, you, you use the word external, I believe, externally driven and internally driven. And you have provided a, a really neat discussion on what constitutes each one of these types. Um, and um, you also finally looked at this concept of the stages of commitment um, and um, uh, indeed how, how we can progress but the steps that we need to do as practitioners or those who might be interested in, in becoming practitioners of interfaith dialogue in order with these stages of commitment that could help us actually in in making the most out of our interfaith dialogue engagement. Thank you so much, Imran. I actually do have a couple of questions that I would like to ask you later on. Thank you again very much for, for uh, talking to us and, and uh, allowing, allowing us to benefit from your deep insights and your um, you know, remarkable uh, level of, of, of um, commitment to interfaith dialogue as well as to your tradition. Thank you very, very much. Well, I, I'm truly, 
I'm, I'm truly uh, impressed by uh, our presentation so far, and I'm sure that uh, our final speaker will have uh, also uh, many useful insights uh, uh, to bring to this discussion. Um, and our, our last final speaker is uh, um, uh, Dr. Phyllis Chu, who is an associate faculty and consultant uh, at the Singapore University of Social Sciences. And if I'm not mistaken, Phyllis, we have met in person a couple of years ago when I was in Singapore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a personal connection, two or three speakers this evening. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Phyllis is also a formerly professor at the Department of English uh, Language and Literature at the National Institute of Education at Nanyang Technology University, uh, uh, where she retired in 2019. Her areas of expertise include gender, comparative religion and linguistics. So she's not only uh, an intellectual and academic, but she also is uh, like all of our speakers this evening. She also has uh, deep roots in, 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 uh, at the level of community engagement. So she has sat on various NGO boards, including she was a past president of the English Language and Literature Association of Singapore, the Association of Women for Action and Research, the, the University Women's Association, and she was also the past director of the United Nations Association of Singapore. Uh, finally, in 2010, uh, Phyllis was a Fulbright visiting professor at Harvard University. And she is currently the board member of the Center for Interfaith Understanding, which is co-hosting this event tonight. Phyllis, thank you again. Thank you very much for being with thank us you. today. And uh, I look forward to listening to you and benefiting from your, from your um, knowledge and insights. Well, it is with some uh, trepidation that I begin my, my part in this seminar. Why? Because uh, before my father died, he gave me some advice. He said that the only thing, the only advice I want to give you is don't ever talk about politics and religion, especially in public. And now we are on Zoom all for all over the world. And also, uh, I remember the advice that my sister gave just before I went for overseas studies. And she says that, I said, can you just give me one sentence because I do hate to listen to lectures. And she said, well, there's only one thing I want to tell you, don't rock the boat. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to disobey both of them. Obedience has never been my strong point. Although I would like to welcome uh, Imran's su suggestion that we have courage. And I would like to use Paul's word, heretics, courage in the in a circle of heretics. Now, let me now define what is commitment. I'm a social linguist, so I'm going to define it from a social linguistic stand. It means that we don't hold back. It means that we have a goal. It means that we don't second guess. It means we are confident. All right. It means that we care deeply about something. It means that we discern a direction. It means that we promise something and we will do something, okay? So uh, I'm going to talk about commitment in the light of Catherine Cornell's article in the area of interfaith dialogue, okay? So my, uh, my, 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 my little talk today is, has two sections. The first is what is commitment, okay? In the context of the Baha'i faith, I'm a Baha'i. And then also what is the action? What is the practical action? Okay, let's go to the first one. All right, let's go to the first one. And the first one is, you know, okay, commitment means to care deeply about something, to have a goal, all right, to keep your promise. So what is this? If there is only one thing that, uh, what, uh, that I can say about the Baha'i faith, can you just summarize it in one sentence? I can say that we care deeply about one thing. If it is only one sentence, we care deeply about world peace and world unity. Okay, if there is only one, one phrase or one sentence, and if you say, just give me one keyword, I don't have time. Okay, then the word is unity. That's all. That's all you need to know. 
okay? So our goal and our promise is world peace, world unity, and the keyword uh, unity. Now, I'd like to share with you some PowerPoint. Please bear with me. I only have about six or seven. Why? Because I want to give you some quotations because otherwise it's like my interpretation, you know? And as you know, we have no clergy. So I just want to show you just a few slides of the writings that, uh, you know, that tells you why I say that the overarching principle is world peace and world unity and how does it relate commitment and the interfaith dialogue. So let me share the screen now. Okay, can you see the screen, everybody? Right. So this yeah. is, yes, thank you. So this is it. Uh, uh, this is uh, my talk. So this is it. Now, this is from the gleanings of the writing so that you can see for yourself. It's from the scripture. By the way, we have a lot of scripture. What do you mean by a lot? Well, a lot means like, uh, like, uh, like uh, 70 times the size of the Quran or 20 times the size of the Bible. Okay, that's, that's a lot. Okay, so here is the phrase from the Baha'i writings. The well-being of mankind is peace and security are unattainable until its unity is firmly established. So this is the difference between the secular world and the Baha'i world. The secular world says, let's have peace, let's have peace, let's have peace talks, let's talk about peace. But the Baha'is will say, it's no point to talk about peace. Let's talk about the subsets, the, the prerequisites of peace. And the prerequisite of peace is unity. Okay, so that's the difference. So the commitment is to unity, okay? Uh, so powerful is the light of unity that it can illuminate the whole world. So everything's about unity and it's about oneness, all right? And I will relate it to interfaith dialogue and commitment later on. Okay, what is the basic premise? The basic premise, huh? this is from the writings because I'm so afraid to miss, misquote you know, to mis-summarize. Okay, the divine purpose is that men should live in unity, concord and agreement, should love one another. I put it in red for you so that it's easier to read. Okay, consider the virtues of the human will and realize that the oneness of humanity is the primal foundation, the primary, primary foundation of them all. Okay, they say read the gospel and the other holy books, you will find that the fundamentals are the same. Therefore, unity is the essential truth of religion, not just of our religion, but all religion. Religion with a capital R, not the small R. And when so understood, embraces the virtues of the human world. Praise be to God. This knowledge has been spread. Eyes have been opened. Years have become attentive. Therefore, we must endeavor to promulgate and practice the religion of God, which has been founded by all the prophets. And the religion of God is... Put it in red, absolute love and unity. So that's how you can distinguish a true religion from a false one. All right. So here is the basic premise. And uh, by the way, uh, this is just being very cheeky on me because I know that my two other speakers are from the Islamic faith and the Christian faith. Um, I, 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 the Baha'i faith is from the third wife of Abraham. We all, you know, we are from the third wife of Ibrahim. I don't know whether you heard of her. She's Katura. So this is the map here. And uh, uh, my grandfather had six wives. So I know how difficult it is uh, to live in a big family uh, like Ibrahim. And as you know, if you are from a minor wife and not the first, if you're the third wife or fourth wife, fifth wife, you, you really have no status. Well, anyway, here comes the third wives. Okay, so here is the line here. And if you can see at the bottom, you can see at the bottom of this, uh, this book here, if you can see, uh, it's a very fascinating account of Abraham. One God, three wives, five religions. So you might want to read that if you, if you like to know a little bit about that. Okay, so, uh, so, so now uh, let me go into the three subsets. Huh? Now that I've established the basic overriding principle of the Baha'i faith, which is world world peace and world unity and oneness, oneness. So in order to achieve world peace, you need to have three things. You need to have three things. One is one God, one God, okay? So here is a quotation from the writing, all right? Uh, so that, uh, and then after this, I will, I, will, I will stop the share, okay? Then I will just uh, give my commentary. 
Okay, here is the one rod quotation. It is clear and evident to thee that all the prophets are the temples of the cause of God okay. who have appeared clothed in diverse attire, right? So they appear at different times, different place, uh, you know, and that's, you can't recognize them because they have been tempered by culture and tradition. And if thou will observe with discriminating eyes, thou will behold them abiding in the same tabernacle, soaring in the same heaven, seated upon the same throne, uttering the same speech and proclaiming the same faith. Such is the unity, you see that word appears again, of those essences of being, those luminaries of infinite and immeasurable splendor. Right? So uh, whether we call, you know, God, uh, Allah, or Jehovah, or Tuhan, or, or, or the Buddha, whatever it is, uh, it's, it is unequivocally stated, unequivocally stated uh, that, uh, you know, it is the same God uh, that we are talking about. It is the same religion with a capital R. Okay, so uh, it goes on to say that the star has the same radiance, whether it shines from the east or west. Okay, so that's it. I'm going to stop share now. And I will now give uh, my uh, commentary. Yeah? All right, so uh, so now, you, you know now that... Um, <clears throat> uh, That we that there is uh, uh, one God, one religion. Okay, unequivocal, right? And uh, there are other other oneness that must come about before we can achieve peace. Okay, uh, so one religion that means that we we definitely very very prone to to interfaith dialogue because we we, we it's, it's very clear in the writings and and because uh, you know the writings are so voluminous. Uh, it, it repeats itself over and over again, okay? In a very uh, exquisite poetry, <laughs> all right? So now, uh, the second thing is that uh, there is also one race, okay? Now, I'm not going to, uh, 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 I, I don't, I don't, I will not bring in the quotation because I want you to, I want to interact with you more, more personally, okay? So in order to have this, uh, this, this unity, okay? This unity, one world, okay? one world and world peace, okay? Because Baha'u'llah says that his mission is to bring the 1,000 years of peace, all right? And we ask him, okay, what's your vision? What's your goal? That's my goal. How do you achieve it? Okay, we achieve it by teaching people that there is one ultimate reality, okay? Oneness of God, oneness of race, okay? We are the drops of one ocean, we are the waves of one sea. Can you please uh, teach me about this? <laughs> okay. And uh, this reminds me of uh, when I was in South Africa, I learned this concept. This concept is called Ubuntu. This is an African concept. And I love this concept, you know, because uh, 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 it says that I am because we are. It's not I am because you are not. So I think that continent of Africa and the concept of Ubuntu it can teach us a lot of things. And by the way, when we talk about one race, okay, uh, this is a dominant feature, one race. Uh, you know, uh, remember, uh, we may look very different, but there is actually only one race, which is the human race, okay? But of course, we have different attire, you know, we have different facial features and all that. And we, you know, and, and when we have this concept of one race, we realize that justice is very important. There can be no justice if we do not recognize that we are from one race, okay? In other words, the hurt of one is the hurt of all. The honor of one is the honor of all, all right? So uh, we should not live under the lie that one race is better than another race, okay? So that is the second oneness. Okay, the second unity that must take place before any talk of peace. Otherwise, don't talk about peace is a waste of time. Because if you don't recognize that races are equal, then uh, how can there be justice? And if there's no justice, why do we want to talk about peace? Okay, and the third oneness, okay, is 
one one world one world now this is very unpopular <laughs> okay uh, that's why a lot of people think i'm very strange uh, they think that i'm very idealistic you know i'm just talking off my boundary yeah 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 the one world one world the world is one country and mankind its citizens quote unquote okay the world is one country and mankind its citizens and uh, why do i like this so much and people hate it so much well because I don't think that the divine who has placed us, uh, look at my background, huh? I don't think that the divine who has placed us on this little speck of dust in the universe wants us to blow ourselves up. It just doesn't make sense to me. We are just a little dot, you know, in the universe. So why, uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't make sense that we, we have to quarrel. You know, if cats and dogs can get together, why can't we get together? I mean, why can't we live in peace? I don't know why, okay? So we have to realize that we are only as strong as our weakest link. Look at the COVID, COVID lockdown. It's been almost two years. You think it's going to be resolved? We are only as strong as the weakest link in this germ thing. <laughs> so we better look after our brothers, if only for our own selfish, selfish end. So this is the oneness of the world. Uh, the Baha'i faith is very much in favor of, uh, of, of, of federalism, you know. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, you know, taking away the boundaries and things like that so that people who have no job there or no food there, they can just move easily, okay. So, uh, so these are the three uh, onenesses, okay, the three unities, which will, uh, you know, which will, according to the Baha'i writings, achieve the peace that he says is his chief mission. That's his chief goal. Okay? And um, because uh, we are committed to uh, non-violence, we are committed to non-violence. Why? Because you see, if we use power to fight with power, then we are duplicating the old world order. Right? So we cannot use power. That's why our growth has been very, very gradual, very, very slow. By, by the way, we are 180 years old. And all these writings were revealed about 180 years ago. Okay. They were translated from Arabic and, 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 and Persian. Uh, Baha'u'llah, uh, well, he didn't go to school. So he was like Prophet Muhammad. You know, this is a revelation writing. Revelation writing. It just comes to him in a gush. And then he will just recite in pure poetry a thousand verses an hour. And he has that amenusis. And then the, you know, there are stories that the pen will fall down and the room will shake and all sorts of things. But anyway, uh, it was a very great revelation resulting in many, 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 many books. Most of them has not been translated because there's so many books. Okay. So, uh, so this is the, uh, 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 the fact, uh, fact that we, we don't like violence. So that means we're not going to get much publicity because as you know, uh, if you want to be violent, then you can get lots of media publicity. Yeah? So we're not violent. Uh, and then, uh, and also we don't join politics. We cannot join politics. You know, uh, I've been asked to join politics before. I can't because why? Because politics is very adversarial. You have to say bad things about the other person. <laughs> you have to exaggerate their thoughts. You have to exaggerate your own uh, good qualities. So uh, that's going to be very, very difficult for us. So we don't join politics. So what else do we have left? Well, we have to have dialogue. That's why this is the interfaith dialogue, right? We have to have dialogue. Dialogue is a very, very slow process. So Baha'is are encouraged to participate in dialogue, not just interfaith, but dialogue on health, dialogue on education, dialogue on uh, economics, dialogue on the widening gap between the rich and the poor, you know, and uh, we do a lot of dialogue actually uh, with subcommittees of the United Nations, all right? Uh, we, recognize, we are recognized as one of the, I don't know what it's called, but we, we, we're, part of, we're part of the UN, okay? And we have, uh, uh, and we are, we do quite a lot of things uh, in terms of rural health and the environment and so forth. So this is just one of the things which is dialogue by interfaith. Okay, so that's the first part. So the first part is that we are 
uh, uh, committed to interfaith dialogue because we have no other ways. Since we don't advocate uh, violence, we don't join politics, what, what else can we do? Okay. And we are committed to interfaith dialogue because we believe in oneness of God. So of course, we, we love to interact with other religions. We are asked to study for other religions. It is, it is part of our aura. It is part of the overarching framework. All right. One God, one re religion, capital R. Uh, there may be small R's, but there's only one R, one capital R. One race, you know, uh, wow. Uh, and, and, and one world, peace. Lah, all right. So that's it. So that's the first part. Now, the second part, uh, there are only two parts. Okay. Uh, the second part is that, okay, now you say you're committed. Can you show us uh, uh, what, 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 uh, what you do, what are the practical aspects, okay, that, that, that you have done. Uh, because you must remember the title of my talk is A Lasting Commitment. Okay, prove it to us. Show us, okay. So uh, let me just say that, yes, uh, i just give you a few points, lah, okay. Uh, because, you know, action speaks louder than words. You know, it's, it's no point to give all the theory and then you never do anything. So, uh, so okay, where interfaith dialogue is concerned, let me show you how we have been committed all right, and I've, I've just quickly jotted down four points because, you know, because I'm given a time limit. So, uh, so one more slide, just one more. Okay, don't worry. Just one more slide. And this slide is, uh, why do I have this slide? Because, you know, I don't want to misinterpret anything. So, uh, this slide shows you that the Baha'i faith was represented, okay, at the 1893 first, first world Parliament of Religion. Wow, that's that's 19th century. Okay, so that's how committed we are. All right. So and by the way, uh, you know, Baha'u'llah was a prisoner, and all the verses was, was written in in prison. <laughs> I don't know how he did it, like, but he did it. You know. So so uh, let me just show you this slide, and it's just a short paragraph because it's if you see it, 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 it you can comprehend it better than if I read it to you. Okay. So let me share screen again, just one slide, promise. Okay, last slide. Okay, so this is the Baha'i faith quoted at the closing of the World Parliament of Religion, 1893, okay? Uh, this was actually quoted uh, by one of the Christian uh, reverends uh, uh, who, 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 who was very enamored with the Baha'i faith. And actually many people who attended the World Parliament and Religion, you know, became Baha'is. Okay, let me just quote to you this phrase, which, you know, was read out to the World Parliament of Religion in Chicago, 1893. And this is the first time that the faith was mentioned in America. Uh, let me read to you that all nations, as a closing address, <clears throat> that all nations should become one in faith and all men as brothers, that the bonds of affection and unity between the sons of men should be strengthened, that diversity of religions should cease and differences of race be annulled. Let me just talk a little bit of this. This is the context of the last century, of the 19th century, the last decade. Europe has been unceasingly at war, the Napoleonic Wars. There were also wars in the US, you know, the Civil War in the United States and all this. So the world was very restless. It was going to be the turn of the century. And actually when Baha'u'llah wrote this in the, in the 1880s, uh, when Baha'u'llah wrote this, uh, he... Uh, shall we uh, shall we say review uh, because he couldn't write uh, because his, he was poisoned so his hand shook so when when this was revealed uh you know he was actually talking about first world war and second world war he was actually telling telling us hey guys you know if, if you don't uh <laughs> do this you know and if you don't have affection and unity and if you don't you know uh you know have a uh, cease your differences of race and if you don't have all these nations, you know, uh, becoming one in faith, you're going to have a hard time. He, he, uh, because I only quote to you a few lines, but 
the other parts that tells you like actually he was talking about first world war second world war and whatever okay what harm is there in this what harm is there in this you know to have equality of race now this was very striking uh. when you read this in 1893 uh, people think you're crazy and even now when i read it people think i'm i'm a heretic so yet so it shall be this fruitless strife these ruinous wars shall pass away and the most great peace shall come. Actually, he's referring to biblical prophecies and the Islamic prophecies, also Buddhist prophecies and all this. All right. Do not you in Europe need this also? He's talking, you know, let not a man glory in this, that he loves his country. Let him rather glory in this, that he loves his kind. No more slides. So let me now just go, uh, just 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 run through very quickly and then close. Okay. All right. So in the second part, I wanted to show you. Prove to me you have a lasting commitment. I quoted to you from the scriptures and I quoted to you our participation at the first world parliament of religion. Okay. And number uh, uh, another thing is uh, uh, is that okay. Uh, 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 you know, one of the principles, not the main one, but, you know, there are a few other principles, is that there must be independent investigation of truth. He says, you must use your head, you must, you, you know, uh, he said, uh, he's, he, he puts it this way. Uh, you see, Imran talks about the well, that every religion has a well, Imran. Let me now talk about, let me use another metaphor. I will use the metaphor of the lamb, the lamb, okay? So let us say that there is a lamb and you tell the person there's a lamb with a light in that room, in the other room. Now, if, if you are very unthinking, you'll say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You won't bother to investigate. Well, actually, as a Baha'i, you have to go into the room where the person say there is a lamb and there is a light in that lamb. And when you go to that room and you say, yes, there is a lamb, lamb and the light is there. There, then it becomes reality. That means you have tested it for yourself. You have to investigate. You have to see with your own eyes and your own ears. You cannot depend on tradition. You cannot depend on your own culture. All right. So this is a hallmark, all right, of being a Baha'i. All right. So that you need to don't depend on hearsay. <laughs> okay. You have independent investigation of truth. And talking about lamb, all right, let me extend the metaphor, all right? And, you know, light is good uh, in whatsoever lamb is burning, right? Uh, this is part of the teachings of Baha'u'llah, right? Uh, and, and, and a light is a light, you know? And, and you know that, uh, you know, there are many lambs with many, many lights. You're not the only one. You're not the only one. So please, if you are lovers of the light, we, we should recognize the light when it shines. But if you just look at the lamp shape, the tradition, the culture, you cannot recognize the light. All right? So you must see with your inner eye and not just at the lamp shape. Right? So light is good in whichever lamp it is burning. A rose is beautiful. In whatever garden it may bloom. You know, we are lovers of the sunlight and not of the sun's orientation. We are lovers of illumination and not of lamps and candles. Thank we you, are sir. seekers of water. We are seekers of water, no matter from which rock it may gush from. And we are in need of fruits whatever orchard it may grow. This is quintessentially Baha'i, all right? And it goes on poetry after poetry pages of the pages, okay? So, uh, okay, so then what other things, okay? Uh, what other things, uh, uh, practical things, okay? Uh, you know, consultation. Oh, oh, please, uh, Phyllis, we are running out of time. Could okay. you kindly conclude? All right, it's 25 minutes. Let me go to my conclusion, okay? So what I've, I've, I have... Uh, I've, I've talked about is uh, I've 
my title is a lasting commitment to interfaith. And what I've shown you is the, that our goal is world peace and that we, and to achieve world peace, we need to have one God, one religion, one race, one world. Judge done all that with you. Let me just say that I'm very honored. Okay. Uh, as a child of the third wife, to sit on this table with you, it has not always been like that. There were times, I think 20, 30 years ago, when they say, oh, can we get Phyllis as a Baha'i? They say, no, she doesn't deserve to sit on this table. All right? She says she should sit on the table with, I don't know, you know, she's not with Christians, not with the children of the first wife or the second wife. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, the next thing I want to say is that I'm very honored also. Okay? And here I'm being very cheeky. Okay? That I can sit with you as a sister. Because it's not always been like that. Okay, sisters are usually not invited to sit on table of brothers. Thank you. And lastly, I sincerely hope okay, that we can continue to learn from each other. That we will not just share our, our strengths, but we will also share our challenges. You know, we will share our dreams, our hopes, our ideals. As we journey together, in our quest for the ultimate reality. Thank you. That was beautifully put, Phyllis. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Uh, uh, for uh, thank you for informing us about how important dialogue is for people from the Baha'i faith, and and for demonstrating to us. The, the long-standing commitment that the Baha'i faith and the Baha'i practitioners have been demonstrating when it comes to, you know, not just talking the talk but also walking the walk. Uh, when when it comes to when it comes to commitment to to ideals such as world peace. So thank you very much for that. So uh, we have come to uh, the final seg segment of our proceedings tonight. Um, I would like to remind our viewers and listeners on Facebook and YouTube to kindly please write the questions, comments into, into the com comment section of, 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 of Facebook. I, I believe we are only on Facebook. I'm not sure if we are on YouTube. So please do, do have your questions do formulate them. Uh, we only have about 20 minutes or so. We'll try to get through as many as possible. While the questions are being formulated by our audience, I would like to perhaps um, ask, use my privilege <laughs> and ask a, a question. Uh, first to Paul. Uh, Paul, you have been rather critical of um, Cornell's uh, condition of, of commitment or, or the way you have understood it. So I was interested to know as to whether or not you've consider this condition of commitment to be more of an obstacle rather than a facilitator of, of, of dialogue and why or why not. And my question to Imran would be, uh, Imran, uh, when you were talking about the stages of commitment, you said, you know, very few people go beyond stage two and there are stages three and four. Do you think that there is value of interface dialogue in, in facilitating or helping people to actually get to those last two stages? What is the role of interface dialogue in, in, that, in, that, in that respect? And again, uh, you had a more favorable view of, of the condition of commitment compared to, compared to Paul. So uh, that is, again, commitment an obstacle or does it facilitate this transition to, to stages three and four? And I haven't had the time to think about a question for Phyllis. Hopefully, it will come from the audience. Or if I've given enough time, I would I'd like to ask Phyllis a question as well. Paul, perhaps if you could start, please. Followed I, by you. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, thank you, Addis. I mean, I think it depends partly what we think that dialogue is and what is the purpose of that dialogue. I mean, as people know it's often sort of set out that there are four types of dialogue, there's sort of theological exchange, there's sort of the dialogue of prayer, there's, there's dialogue of life and sort of dialogue of action. Um, and within these sort of different types of sort of dialogue, if you like people's commitment to their 
tradition can be very distant. I mean, in terms of sort of action, you know, if you want social work done, then you don't necessarily start with sort of like people's belief commitments. It's, you know, like we all believe in social justice, we can go out there and we can change the world. Um, and if you like this thing, particularly amongst sort of um, young people, I think it's an excellent way to start off um, sort of getting things done. Now, having said that, of course, you know, you've got a commitment to certain types of social justice. And I don't think that I'm if like attacking um, sort of Cornell's notion of sort of commitment. I'm simply saying commitment is more, if you like, than about the intellectual sort of um, conditions. It's more than about the doctrines. There, there's lots of things we can be committed to. Um, and I think, you know, Cornell's conditions, they're, they're an absolutely fantastic tool for helping us to think about this, what might be involved in dialogue. Um, but like sort of many theologians, I, I think Cornell sort of focuses in, upon dialogue like it's a very sort of an intellectual activity. Um, it's like a thing like theologians and elites to come together. And so you need these ideas. People have to be, you know, have, have these ideas sort of centrally placed there. So no, I, I'm not sort of disputing commitment. I'm just suggesting we have a wider picture of commitment. Um, also, if I could perhaps just slightly sort of sure. get on another line as well with this. Um, I think sort of Phyllis's final point sort of raised the question that of course there have been many times many places where perhaps sort of Baha'is or others wouldn't have been allowed in to dialogue. Um, pagan groups are often sort of not allowed in, um, atheists or agnostics or others will not be allowed into dialogue and also as you said there's a gender aspect and of course there are racial aspects to do this as well which of course was part of her talk. Um, and again, if we stress sort of this idea of like, you know, of creeds and belief, then again, it shapes what we're looking at, you know, sort of indigenous sort of traditions often don't have the same creed or sort of net um, set up. So where do they fit um, within sort of dialogue if we just sort of take it within some very traditional ways of looking at it? So, you know, I'm not trying to sort of say, you know, what Cornelius said was wrong. I said it's a good starting point for helping us to think, but, you know, we also need to go beyond it. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Um, yeah, uh, uh, you see, um, the, 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 I guess the, um, the crucial question here, the crucial element of this dialogue, uh, where, where Co Co Professor Cornell was coming from, she was kind of trying to think about what the constructive conditions or prerequisites are, uh, as Imran was trying uh, alluded in his presentation. So the commitment was kind of seen as countering this idea of pure subjectivity, kind of exploratory, kind of uh, commitment that does not really take into account the, the accumulated religious heritage that one even nominally be belongs to. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, Imran. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, not sure if I get your question, but you are asking whether to move from stage two to three, uh, whether commitment will be an obstacle or whether it can facilitate, yeah. Um, well, did we, yeah. generally, more generally, would interfaith dialogue play a positive role in all of this, like in, in getting people to move from the second stage to the third and the fourth stage? Yeah, uh, I mean, being an advocate uh, of interfaith dialogue, definitely, I would say it will play a positive role in terms of bringing people from, from each of the stages. Uh, but it also depends on how uh, uh, interfaith dialogue is being conducted and how it's being framed and how uh, what are the pedagogical approaches that uh, is being used that are being used uh, in, in these uh, settings. So it requires um, a lot of um, uh, thinking through of the kind of ways in which we bring people from the to, to the various stages. So it's not just a, simply a matter of coming together, having a dialogue, and then naturally expecting people to move from the stage to, to, to another stage. Uh, so I don't think interfaith dialogue is just a simple matter of coming together and talking about issues. I think it requires a lot more homework, uh, and it probably requires uh, uh, some sort of facilitation also by those who are uh, uh, deeply involved in interfaith dialogue to also guide through the process. Um, and that is where the whole commitment lies uh, of why someone would want to be involved in interfaith dialogue in the first place. Uh, but uh, right at stage one, perhaps the encounter might be even more simpler uh, and less complex. Uh, but as one 
uh, move from the stage of curiosity uh, towards greater awareness of the diversity and the uh, wanting to engage with that differences, uh, then that is where interfaith dialogue can play a promising role in terms of uh, pushing further towards uh, the various stages. Um, yeah, I think that's what I can say at this stage. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I will say, can I can I add something to the no. two? Um, I think in interfaith dialogue, we learn from each other, okay, uh, so that we can strengthen and relate it to our own faith to see where the matches are, and then also others learn from you. So it's a uh, two ways. Two ways we learn from others, and others learn from us. So that our own faiths can, you know, be strengthened. And then there's also a stress on humility. I think when we do interfaith, we cannot assume that uh, we cannot have this, uh, you know, uh, we, we cannot assume that uh, we have all the answers. We have to put all, we have put all our ideas in a circle and then may the truth, whatever, emerge from that discussion, you know. You know, it's not about who is right. It's about what is right. So, uh, so, so I think that uh, those who do interfaith, as uh, Catherine Cornell says, uh, we, we have to have humility, empathy, uh, empathy, humility, interaction, you know, and of course, commitment. Commitment to, to, to listening, to listening and to understanding and to sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our audience is rather shy this evening, so we haven't had any questions. I'd like to encourage our audience to please, no question is too dumb. I, I, have, I have often asked dumb questions myself, so no question is too dumb. <laughs> or too I, I, yeah, if one of our panelists have any questions yeah. to, to have, other, um, other panelists, yeah. Yeah, I have one question for Phyllis and one for Paul Hedges. Uh, Phyllis, uh, you mentioned that uh, I'm trying to understand here in the Baha'i faith, um, that in order to achieve world peace, then you need one religion. Yeah. Uh, did I uh, get that correctly? No. Uh, in order to achieve world peace, the world, world uh, the religion should not fight with one another because okay. uh, so therefore, in order for the religion not to fight one another, we have to have things like what we're doing now, interfaith dialogue, so that we can understand each other and we can understand that we actually are all trying to search for the truth, to search for the mystery, to search for what this reality is, mm -hmm. that we only have a certain perspective from our faith. Yeah. So, so when we say oneness of religion, what I mean is that we are all, uh, shall we say, a, a kind of cognitive relativism where we believe that everyone has their own perspective. And so everyone has a part of the truth because they are seeing it from their own relative context. Yeah. Okay? So that's what I mean. I don't mean one religion. Uh, there has been thank many you, religions. Thank you for that clarification because I was thinking at the back of my mind that we need diversity in order for interfaith dialogue to even happen because if everyone believes in the same thing, then there can be no dialogue. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. For Paul, I just a simple question: What happened to England, England's football team? <laughs> anyway, yeah, I mean, it's just just a joke. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, yes. Um, uh, I don't follow the idea. Uh, but if, if I could ask a, a question, sort of back, perhaps, um, sort of generally, um, I mean, we've been talking about some different words here, obviously focusing around sort of um, commitment, mm. but uh, I noticed in your talk sort of, Imran, you mentioned this word transformation in dialogue. And of course, I think this is always a tension um, in dialogue. Like you want to be sort of committed to sort of where you come from, but at the same time, as you said, you, you're learning from the other person. So transformation takes place. And then I think you know, for people coming from outside dialogue, if they're not used to it, this this is the thing that worries you, that you change through this process and it's seen as weakening or diluting um, somehow. Um, and, and also, if you like the word that Phyllis used, if like of humility as a key point sort of here. Um, and I was just wondering, perhaps you could reflect a little bit more about how these sort of, you like the notions of commitment and transformation and humility all tie in together, perhaps from your own perspective. 
and I don't yes. maybe fellows would like to speak to it as well. <laughs> yes. Oh. Ah, because many of us, uh, when we are brought up in a certain faith, uh, everything has been put in very neatly for us in a little box. Okay, so whatever is in the box is what we should learn and practice. And whatever is outside of the box, we, we shouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be good because if it was good, it would have already been put in the box. Okay, so that's what most of us grow up with. So the thing is, but this is not uh, scientific. This is not scientific because in science, science is always evolving, right? And our perspective on religion is also a relative perspective depending on the time that we live in, okay? Depending on, it's also been colored by our culture, also been colored by many years of tradition, of scholarly tradition. So if we want to be scientific, we must realize that truth, as we share our truth, our truth will evolve. We will grow. We get ideas, you know? And then we begin to understand deeper. This is how we learn. This, this is science, this is scientific, this is how we learn. So, uh, so we must be committed to this way of learning, this process, you know. But we, of course, have our own little uh, 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 faith as our own guideline, you know, and our own frame, you know. But we will may adjust the frame slightly, you know, as, as, we, as we journey on, okay, because this is how we learn. This is how we progress. Yeah, yeah. I think Paul, you you raise a very important question, uh, and um, let me see if I can think this through. Um, of course, there there is there will be a tension between commitment and also transformation in that sense. But uh, it also depends on how we understand commitment. Uh, firstly, um, I understand it as uh, in two aspects. One is commitment to our own faith tradition. Uh, but also adopting the principle of humility, it also means that we must recognize that we are not the whole sum of that tradition. Uh, and therefore, we are not representative of the entire tradition, but just a small part of that tradition in which tradition itself is not something that is static. It is also evolving. And we make traditions as we move along uh, in, 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 in engagement with the changing situations and the context of time, location, etc. That's one. And secondly, when we talk about commitment, it also could be understood in the sense of our commitment towards truth. And here, again, adopting the principle of humility, we can acknowledge that we are not the ultimate uh, truth. Uh, and, and truth resides outside of us. Uh, and we are not the full measure of what truth is in itself. And therefore, it allows us to be on the path of seeking and searching for truth uh, with the capital T, um, but uh, at the same time also, it allows us to be transformed in our uh, process of uh, 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 moving towards that truth that we are seeking. So in that sense, uh, I don't see um, a necessary contradiction between transformation and commitment, but rather they are complementary of each other. Yeah. Uh, all right, I had to dovetailing on Paul's uh, question, perhaps last question for this evening, before we conclude, uh, to Imran, um, you've, you've talked about two forms of commitment, the externally driven and the internally driven. One is more utilitarian and transactional, the other one is more transformational, as, as Paul uh, just alluded to. I was just wondering, um, to what extent, based on your personal experience and, and dealing with other people who or part of the interfaith dialogue scene. Have you seen, uh, and you yourself, have you experienced perhaps transitions from one form to the other? Does that happen? Uh, is that a bad thing, not a bad thing? Uh, is it possible to be just purely uh, internally kind of driven and not externally driven at all or vice versa? Uh, well, the, the quick and simple answer to that is uh, my own personal experience. Uh, uh, struggling with this issue. Um, well, I've been personally transformed uh, uh, in my early years uh, through my engagement with people of other faiths in the sense that I uh, no longer see it as a, uh, firstly, I, I was in this mode where uh, I'm, I'm supposed to impose the truth on others and they're supposed to 
see the truth as how I see it. And therefore it confirms that I am uh, holding the truth. Uh, but in my engagement with them, I've been transformed in the sense that I begin to see uh, dimensions of truth that uh, I've not seen before. And, and, and I begin to appreciate uh, through my connection and relationship building with people of other faiths. So that is a transformation that I went through. But, uh, and, and it comes to a point where I would say that I will enjoy having a cup of coffee uh, or drinking tea together with them. Uh, but then it also provokes a, another set of questions because that is very utilitarian in the sense that, okay, we, we must be together. We must uh, enjoy a cup of coffee, eat together, uh, you know, uh, partake in social activities together because we all want peace, because we all want to live harmoniously together with each other. But I begin to enjoy it so much that I begin to think, what about the afterlife? If I, I'm here enjoying a cup of tea with Paul Hedges uh, and we connect so much at this level that I, can I imagine having a cup of tea together with Paul Hedges in the, in the afterlife? Or will I be thinking that I will have a different path and he will have a different path uh, and therefore we will be separated and even me thinking that uh, you, you, you'll burn in hell Paul forever. <laughs> and then that's not my, my, none of my business, you know? But right here on earth, well, let's keep it utilitarian. I'll have a cup of tea with you because we need to not kill each other. <laughs> so, so that actually puts me on a path where I begin to even question my own theology of religion and, and in digging into my own tradition and looking at the various hermeneutical ways to overcome this kind of tension that I encountered and, and therefore it transformed me in the process. And now I'm uh, uh, a Muslim who's committed to the idea uh, that uh, in matters of salvation, then we should not close the door to, to anyone. Uh, and therefore, I, hopefully I will have a cup of tea with Paul Hedges in the hereafter, because I cannot imagine uh, hereafter without some of my uh, good friends and people that I enjoy uh, being together in com companion with. Yeah. That's a beautiful uh, thought, uh, Imran. Uh, this reminds me of this Muslim poet uh, who is actually, uh, well, very close to being my, my favorite poet, actually. Okay, Jalaluddin Rumi, uh, I think 12th century Afghanistan or something. And he says, uh, let the beauty we love be what we do. There are thousands of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. I just love this verse so much. Um, thank you. Uh, we might as well uh, end on that uh, wonderful Rumi quote note. So um, it's been a, a, a really a, a, a huge pleasure to, to, to be part of this uh, webinar this evening. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I have thoroughly enjoyed and learned from all of you. Uh, I do hope that we can continue uh, that being engaged in these types of discussions. I would like to remind our audience that um, we are going to have our fourth installment of this series uh, in a couple of months time. Uh, and I look forward to uh, doing this again in a very near future. Thank you again. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Edison. Thank you, Ivan and Phyllis. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone.